Okay, today we're going to talk about the respiratory tract, uh, or the whole respiratory system. If you look in your lab guide on page 85, we'll start with that and just kind of go down and show you everything you need to know. Uh, the first thing you need to know are the nasal, uh, or excuse me, the nares, or that would you call them the nostrils. That's just the holes in your nose where you get air into your uh, respiratory system. So those are your nasal uh, nares, excuse me. And then the nares lead into this space here called the nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity is everything behind your nose, basically, that whole big cavity there. Inside the nasal cavity, it's lined with a mucous membrane, so it has a, a moist surface in there, and there are a lot of blood vessels that uh, are in there as well, because one of the main reasons you breathe through your nose is because you want to warm and moisten and humidify the air that you're breathing in. You also have these little bumps inside the nose. These are known as your nasal conchi. You have your superior, then you have your uh, medial and inferior nasal conchi. Um, again, bumps increase surface area, so the whole point of what you're doing here is you're increasing surface area so that you can warm and moisten or humidify the air. Um, but be sure you know your nasal conchi, and then just remember that this is all lined with uh, a nasal uh, mucous membrane. Um, you also, if you're looking uh, from this direction at your nose, you have a nasal septum. Now, that's not made out of bone. All right, if you look at the uh, skull, you'll notice that your nose looks hollow there. You don't have a bone that comes out like that. That bone is actually cartilage that is made of your nasal septum. Um, your nasal septum is just a divider between the right and left sides of your nose. Um, the nasal septum is built up on this perpendicular plate which runs inside the nose there. Remember the perpendicular plate is made up of two bones. You've got the ethmoid bone at the top and then the vomer bone at the bottom that come together and that's what causes this perp perpendicular plate to be formed. And then your nasal septum is built of cartilage on top of that. Um, you have um, your, your ethmoid bone up at the top here if you look on the inside of the skull you can see that's the outline of your ethmoid bone right there. Um, there's little holes down in there. Those are called the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And what happens is you have your, um, let me get this guy's brain out. You have your, your, yeah, zoom in on that. You've got your olfactory nerve that comes up on the uh, inferior surface of your brain. Well, that actually sits right in there like that. And so where that olfactory nerve comes up, you're gonna have little fibers that come down from that. Those fibers are gonna go through the holes in the cribriform plate, and then they're gonna come out through the roof of your nose, so they're gonna kinda of line the roof of your nose. So when you smell something, basically what's happening is you're getting, uh, the mucus inside your nose is dissolving the odiferous substance. That's gonna hit on these olfactory nerve fibers that are coming out through the cribriform plate, and be transmitted back up to the olfactory nerve to your brain. So remember it sits like that and that olfactory nerve comes out and then it goes down through those cribriform plate holes and then comes out through the nasal cavity there. Okay, um, your nasal cavity then is everything behind your nose. Well then you start into this other hole right here. This is the beginning of your pharynx. Your pharynx is this area right here. You commonly would call your pharynx your throat. But your pharynx is actually divided up into three separate parts. The part of the pharynx that's behind the nasal cavity right here is going to be known as your nasopharynx. Um, inside the nasopharynx, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to see a, a, a little mass of tissue here. That's going to be the first of one of your tonsils. That little mass right there is known as your pharyngeal tonsil. Commonly, you would call it your adenoids, but we're gonna use the word pharyngeal tonsil right there. Um, remember, your tonsils are simply um, lymphoid tissue that uh, kind of fight things. Anytime you have an opening into your body, you're gonna to have to have some sort of lymphoid tissue that's gonna kind of help fight off invaders there. Um, so that's what that pharyngeal tonsil is. If you have a lot of trouble with your adenoids and your tonsils swelling up, you can see where that swells right there. That would block air passages. Um, sometimes they'll take them out. The tonsils that they usually remove um, when you hear somebody's getting their tonsils out, these are going to be a little lower. They're going to be in the oropharynx or the cavity behind 
uh, or excuse me, the, the tube behind the oral cavity. So there's your oropharynx right there. But those tonsils right there are known as your palatine tonsils. So that's when somebody says, my tonsils are swollen, they're usually referring to those palatine tonsils. And remember, that's your uvula hanging down right there. So if you tell somebody to open their mouth and say, ah, you can look back and you can see the tonsils sitting on either side of the uvula. So those are usually red and swollen when they get inflamed. Um, so those would be your uh, pharyngeal tonsils. These would be your uh, palatine tonsils. You have one other set of tonsils, which are way down here at the base of the tongue, and they're not shown on the models. Those would be your lingual tonsils. Remember, lingual refers to tongue. Um, so those would protect things as things come into your oral cavity. You have the lingual tonsils back here that will protect that oral cavity as well. So those are your three sets of tonsils. Um, if you go back um, to your pharynx or your throat, but you call it pharynx, not throat, um, you've got the nasopharynx, which is this part of the throat, or the uh, pharynx behind the nasal cavity. Then you have the oropharynx, which is this part of the pharynx behind the oral cavity. And then you have the laryngopharynx down here, which um, is this whole area right here, and it, that uh, encompasses your voice box or your larynx. Um, your larynx, basically, if I put this model together and this is a little blown up there. That's going to sit like this in your throat, like that, okay? So you've got this big prominent uh, piece of cartilage here. That's known as your thyroid cartilage. You commonly would call that your Adam's apple, okay? Um, it's larger in males um, and more prominent because of the testosterone. But basically, this whole little area right here is your voice box which we call the larynx. Don't say larynx, it's larynx. Rinx, 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 okay? Um, if you look at the way this is set up, so that's kind of this part blown up here, right here, you've got this flap right here on top of the um, trachea. So that's the, the trachea that takes uh, air down to your lungs. So this little flap right here, that's known as your epiglottis. Epi means uh, upon or on top of. Well, then what's the glottis? Well, the glottis is actually this opening that you, you can kind of see a crack in there. Um, that opening through the trachea is known as the glottis. So if we um, get John to zoom in there, okay, that opening there is the glottis. Well, so air is going to be blocked off from going down this trachea when this epiglottis or this little flap right here folds down. So that's the epiglottis and that can block off what's going into the trachea. Then the glottis is just that slit or opening where air goes through and then it goes through the trachea. Notice you can always tell the trachea because it has cartilaginous rings around it. Um, you can feel it in the front of your throat and you always know that the trachea is uh, anterior to the esophagus, um, and you can look on here and see that there's your trachea on the anterior surface, and there's the esophagus, which is posterior to it, but you can always feel the cartilaginous rings if you feel in your throat. So that's those cartilaginous rings. Well, now why do you need those? You've got to have this cartilage to support the trachea to maintain your airway. You don't want to ever have it collapse. It's okay if your esophagus collapses, so it's just made of muscle. But the the trachea you don't want to collapse because you always want to maintain that airway. Notice the rings do not go completely around. On the back side here where the esophagus is running right here, you're not going to have cartilage that goes back here. You're going to have what's known as a trachealis muscle that kind of holds these cartilaginous, cartilaginous rings together. That's so that when you have a bolus of food that is coming down the esophagus, back here, you don't want it to come up here and then bump up against hard cartilage and get stuck. So you have this tracheallus mus muscle right there where the esophagus runs up against it and that allows for a more smooth transition as food's being pushed down through your esophagus. Um, if you look inside your um, larynx, which is this lower area of the uh, it's, it's, it's the laryngopharynx, so it's the lower area of your throat. This whole thing is called the larynx. You've got two folds of tissue. You've got this fold of tissue on the top of the glottis. That little white strip right there is showing where the, the glottis opens up. So if you're looking at it like through there, you'd see that white strip, but that's just the opening. But this fold on top is known as a, 
vestibular fold or false vocal cord or false yeah false vocal cord and that really doesn't have anything to do with voice production that just um, helps with the opening and closing of the glottis then underneath this you have this you can see it's uh, skeletal muscle right there that's your true vocal fold or the um, true vocal cord and again it's made out of skeletal muscle and that's because you control your you know what's going on there you push more air in and out of your uh, glottis and that's how you can change your uh, vocal uh, tones on males this vocal cord right here the, the true vocal fold is going to be larger and longer and so think of it as a bass guitar a bass guitar has got these long thick strings and that gives it a deeper voice or a deeper resonance whereas females these this will be shorter and thinner and so that gives most females um, a higher pitch to their voice all right so then you